Hello, everyone. Welcome to Breaking Bread, a fresh look at virtual diplomacy. I am Christina Bolin, and for those of you in China, bye year. And I will be your host and moderator for the discussion today. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a junior from the NYU Shanghai campus in China, and I'm currently a student in the Global Leadership Program at NYU Washington, DC. And this semester, I've also had the opportunity to intern at the Asia Society with the Director of Culture as Diplomacy, as Sabrina would know. And that is where this inspiration to do this event has come from. And we are here today, and you all are joining us today through the Q&A feature and just with us in conversation because COVID-19 has tried to pull us apart and need us to our breaking point. And we cannot let a virus stop us from starting these cultural exchanges and getting to know one another. There are Asian hate crimes happening. We have Black Lives Matter protests going on and I'm in DC and every day I go down to the National Mall and see another protest going on. There is a growing misunderstanding and miscommunication between our different communities. And it is important that we figure out ways of facilitating online avenues to get to know one another. And that is why we are discussing this conversation today. And I am so excited to introduce our esteemed panelists for today's discussion. Joining us is Ambassador Capricia Marshall. She is the president of Global Engagement Strategies, which, advise, which advises international, public, and private clients on issues relating to the nexus of business and cultural diplomacy. Ambassador Marshall served as White House Social Secure Secretary in the Clinton administration from 1997 to 2001. And she was the United States Chief of Protocol in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2013. Marshall is currently ambassador in residence at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. And she recently, a book I have read, has launched her book called Protocol, The Power of Diplomacy and How to Make It Work for You. And also we have Ms. Sabrina Lynn Motley, who is joining us as well. She is the director of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. During her tenure, she has expanded research and programming and explored new forms of festival making. And prior to her appointment, she worked at the Asia Society Texas Center, Japanese American National Museum, and the J. Paul Getty Museum. So thank you both so much for joining us. Before we get into the real nitty gritty parts of our conversation, I'm going to turn the first question over to Sabrina. Can you tell us a little bit about what breaking bread means to you? And what did your work look like, be look like before the pandemic started with the Smithsonian Folklife Festival? Great. Well, first of all, thank you, Christina, for uh, doing this, for bringing us together, for inviting me. And also I wanna thank Rachel Cooper for all of the good work she's done at Asia Society. Um, your question's a good one, and it's something that um, shapes our future. Um, you know, we're, we're still doing a little bit of our before and after um, thinking. You know, the, fest the Folklife Festival started in 1967. It was really meant as a way to bring people together into physical, in a physical space, the National Mall, this sort of sacred space um, for conversation, dialogue, to explore creativity to just for um, representation and identity. Um, and we place a premium on that intimacy, the physical intimacy. So when that was stripped away from us, it really did, um, we went into a little bit of a free fall until we started thinking about issues. You know, as you, you mentioned so clearly, there were all of these conversations, the pandemic, um, you know, all of this, all of these issues around racial reckoning. And so we knew that even though we couldn't be on the mall, we had to figure out a way to, to bring people together. So um, I think at the core, we were, we knew that if we, we, if we held on to our values and our mission and our purpose, that we would be okay, even as we were entering into this new landscape that we all are living on. And so, um, that was sort of, you know, that, that was where we were um, when pandemic hit and we're continuing to learn and make a whole lot of mistakes and um, but press forward. 
And Capricia, can you tell us a little bit about your work during the pandemic and how you were able to move your experience online? Oh, sure. Um, well, again, I, I want to add my, uh, my gratitude uh, to that of Sabrina's to you and to the NYU community for uh, this invitation. I think this discussion about breaking bread, um, food and, and the way in which it can affect our relationships um, between people here in the United States um, and to help to bridge differences as um, I found it quite useful in my former capacity as chief of protocol, it bridged differences around the world. Um, I also had the wonderful, wonderful as social secretary when I served uh, in the Clinton administration of working um, with the Folklife Festival folks um, under, I'm sure you know, Sabrina well, Richard Curran. Everybody knows Richard Curran, <laughs> the magic and sometimes the frustrations of Richard Curran. Um, but he uh, he and I worked together on the millennium. When, during the, the millennium, we, we, we worked on the um, using the Folklife Festival as a way of marking this change in time. And it was phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, at that time, the the Washington Monument was covered and um, because it was going under repair. And so they then allowed us to put um, lights and fireworks uh, to once we hit the 2000 mark, you know, at midnight, it just kind of exploded from the Lincoln Memorial all the way up the Washington Monument. It was quite spectacular um, with celebrations then throughout the day. Uh, the work that you all do at the Smithsonian is truly spectacular. And it's a way in which we tell our American story in so many different manners and through the various museums and so many different capacities. It's just, um, I am uh, I am in awe, constant awe of what you all do. I, you know, since the pandemic, Christine, I know I'm going on and on a little bit, but, but since the, the pandemic hit, I, you know, we've all made these adjustments to um, our schedules, our manner of communication uh, from the two dimension, from the three dimensional to the two dimensional, it's, um, you know, it's, it's very, very different. And Sabrina is right to note that that personal, that tangible mm, moment that you have with people in person, you know, I, I talk about it in the book that you, you noted, um, those, those, those judgment calls that we make upon first meeting someone and getting to know them that thin slicing opportunity that we that we have with uh, those engagements, they're lost. You know, we um, we find ways in which we can express ourselves and 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 make those um, make those uh, connections via the virtual, but it's a little harder. And so you have to engage more. You have to figure out new ways in which you can let people know about yourself and and the importance of what you want to discuss and and unlike what I'm doing right now, get to the point of what you want to say and be really brief about it. So um, we'll get into this discussion a little bit more uh, throughout our time here, but it is certainly a very different time. Yes. And I just want to jump in like, yes, your book, I was reading it, you know, going up to New York the other day and wow, like what really struck me about your book is the fact that there are these nuances that happen within a diplomatic initiative or meeting people in person. And that really gets lost when you're meeting in person. And Sabrina, when you are at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, what were the nuances and the exchanges like for people in person? You know, one of the things that strikes me about the Folklife Festival, and again, I, I, I put um, the links are in the chat. So you, if you don't know the festival, I do encourage you to visit us and learn more. Um, so over the course of 10 days, at the end of June, the beginning of July every year, you, know, you have hundreds of thousands of people come together who some of them you know, might know the country, the state, the city, the occupation that we're featuring and many who don't. But what I find so wonderful is that we have participants that we bring from all over the world, artists, artisans, cooks, dancers, musicians, and they all say, I didn't know that people would be interested in what I do, right? So this basic act of, of story sharing um, has such power. Um, and sometimes I think we take that for granted because we're bombarded with stories. 
daily, but when you see it play out on the mall um, in the heat of the summer and we're all sort of wilting and then you look over and there's this exchange that frankly would not have been possible anywhere else or for a number of reasons, um, the depth of that engagement um, is really quite extraordinary to facilitate and to watch. And I've only been at the festival now for seven years. And I tell you, say only because at the Smithsonian, people tend to be there for very, very long periods of time. But it's striking to me how I'm out and about and somebody will say, you know, my parents took me to the Folklife Festival and it changed so many things for me. And now I'm, you know, X, Y, Z, I'm an anthropologist or I'm a politician or I'm a, you know, whatever because of that moment. It, and again, it's that act of exchange um, that is just so critical. So I think that, you know, that's where, that's where, that, that's the secret sauce, just providing a space where people can be open, can ask questions respectfully, and we hope um, listen with an open heart. Yes. And before we go too further into this conversation, we had Chef Manit Chohan, who is a featured judge on Chopped, give us a video of her thoughts on breaking bread and what it means to bring people together online around food, which is, you know, this conversation. So I want to make sure that we incorporate her video as well. And we thank you so much, Chef Chohan, for giving us this video so we can cue it up and let's see what she has to say. My sister is a software engineer and um, I used to see her working from home. And I would say, I'm like, this is so amazing. I wish as a chef, I could work from home uh, and bring people together through food, but it's just not possible. I think what last year taught us was that it actually is possible. And that to me is one of the most amazing parts about the resilience of people and the innovation uh, of people. So last year has been incredible for me because uh, I couldn't do what I do on a normal basis. That is go in front of people, give demos, judge, uh, and uh, talk to people about food, have them taste food. So one of the funnest things was all of these virtual cooking classes. And literally these were cooking classes in which we would send recipes to people. People would get the recipes, they would get all the ingredients, the cooking list. And then, um, you know, we would virtually cook together and ask questions together. And I remember so often just like, looking in and I'm like, oh, okay, that flatbread looks good or that rice looks good or that curry looks good. I mean, uh, a year back, th this would have been such uh, in the realm of, of sci-fi. And uh, I, I think the virtual food world that we have arrived to right now is incredible. The fact that we can connect with anybody in the world uh, through either me giving demos, which I give on a weekly basis, uh, or um, just judging, having conversations. But the underlying thing is that it is food that brings us together. It's the food that bridges the distances. It's food that we can have conversations on. I always tell people that um, if all conversations were uh, were spoken in food, there would be no arguments. Uh, and I think that is what this virtual world has got us to. It has got us to the fact that we can cook together while we are still not together. We could be in different parts of the world and we're still cooking together. So uh, recently I did an event um, with the taste of tennis a city taste of tennis and i was in my kitchen and i was cooking along with monica sellis the legend uh, and teaching her and all the people who had joined us on how to make a shrimp curry with tomato rice and my best part favorite part was when she took the first bite of it and her eyes went wow she had that wow moment that um, she had created this she had cooked this herself and the fun part was that it was the first time that she'd ever cooked Indian food. So to me, I think, um, I think it's incredible. It's fun. Uh, I, I love this world of um, virtual demos and judging. 
I do miss the real world and I'm looking forward to getting back to that. But uh, this absolutely serves a purpose. Thank you. Wow. That was a great. Thank you so much again, Chef Chohan, for giving us that video. It, I found the first time I watched it, I was when she mentioned the part on sci-fi. I was like, it is kind of sci-fi <laughs> that people are cooking together online. And she's like peeking in, looking at people cooking the bread. And I just want to toss it over to you, Capricia. Like, what is it about food and cultural diplomacy that go together? And why is it that people are using this as a medium to get together online now? Oh, well, you know, I, I, first, I think the world of her as a chef. And um, I have, during this virtual time period, I have taken so many online cooking classes. I'm loving it, loving it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I leave my desk space and I make my way into the kitchen and it just turn my camera off while some, someone's rattling on so that I can, I can do a virtual uh, class cooking. Um, it is, um, you know, I guess that I understood the power of food um, and and the and the bridging network that it had uh, the, the bridging ability rather for networks uh, that it has uh, from a very early age. Growing up in my grandmother's kitchen, I'm a first generation American of Mexican and Croatian descent, and I lived with my maternal grandmother as Mexican um, for most of my life. And she had this teeny little house, uh, half of a, a duplex. My cousin and aunt and uncle lived next door. And, um, and Sundays at Nani's house were just filled with people. And I mean filled. And everybody had a job. And when she was making uh, tamales or tortillas, my job was to stir the mole. And the mole was very important element of these meals. And you had to stir it just right and very slowly. And so you wanted to not scorch it, you know, because abuel, my, my abuelita would not be happy. Um, <laughs> but during that time it was communal. There were discussions. Now, in our family, it was, as I said, not only Mexican and Croatian, but also uh, neighbors would come over who are Polish and Russian. In Cleveland, Ohio, we have lots of ethnic communities. And, and our neighbors across the street, Lebanese, and they would share their foods, their traditions, their culture with us. We had a little bit of a mini UN going on in grandma's kitchen. And, and that just became a part of my core, how important food is to creating those important connections. And I took that to my position as chief of protocol when I was so honored to have been appointed by President Obama uh, into our discussions. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was a part of a, um, a early on in the administration, uh, you know, I've known Hillary Clinton for so many, many, many years. She's been a mentor of mine. And she, serving as Sec Secretary of State, was hosting a, um, an, a, one of her counterparts at a very formal luncheon on the eighth floor of the State Department. And you know, I, I've gotten to know sort of her looks. And at this luncheon, right at the time, you know, we had served up okay meal. You know, like it was a chicken dish that was fine with a little bit of rice and some vegetables. Did it say anything about who we are as Americans? Did, was there any connection that we were trying to make with our counterpart? No. And so she kind of looked at her plate. She looked at me. She looked at her plate. She looked at me and I said, uh-oh, we have an issue. And she wanted us to do more. And she was right. We were missing a huge opportunity in our bilateral negotiations in the way that we were connecting with other people around the world. We were saying nothing about our American cuisine and we certainly weren't talking about the importance of this relationship. So I launched uh, the Diplomatic Culinary Initiative and we brought in all the chefs from the State Department, the White House, Blair House, the President's Guest House and discussed how can we use these food opportunities, the breakfast, the luncheons, the dinners, the teas, the coffees, as a way in which we can create, use as soft power tools to create a, a stronger connection with our counterparts and also draw them into a little bit more of our line of thinking. It's a, it's a bit of a power pivot food, food can be because um, if once you sort of make that aha, moment and they feel like, you know, like as the chef said that Monica Sellis had, wow, I did this. You can create that, that moment. You're pulling them a little bit closer into even your foreign policy objectives. And so we found the power of food an incredibly potent soft power, soft power tool in our diplomatic endeavors. Wow. 
what a great story. And that reminds me of when Chef Chohan mentioned that if all conversations were spoken in food, there would be no arguments, right? Because food is like, that. that's the key. That's the sauce right there. So, <laughs> so, actually, I just actually, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. Because I think if we, if we, if our conversations were in food, we'd fight about important things. You know, this is, this spice is better than that spice. You know, we, we would take, we would spend our time arguing about things that feed our souls, you know, and um, I, you know, it, it is a world that I'd want to live in. I just don't want to make it sound like food, um, food open stores, but it also points to the places where there's tension and friction. And I think about, you know, um, in 20, um, 18, the Folklife Festival, one of its programs was on Armenia, um, which was extraordinary and complicated. And we did, we did a, a blog post on Armenian pizza, Lachmajun. And what we got back was that's not Armenian. You know, that's, you know, that, that belongs to somebody else. And this is, you know, and it was this really sort of rich conversation. So it does point to the things that we hold dear um, and the things that people are really willing to sort of go to bat for. So I think that you're right. It's, it's a food is definitely a way to bring us together, but it also does show us, you know, you know there's some, there's some places where we're like, yeah, no, this is ours. You, you can't have it. You can like it, but you can't have it. <laughs> or if you like it, you've got to do it this way. I mean, I was listening to you talk about, you know, making mole and I was like, I could smell it and taste it. And, you know, conversations that I've had with friends from Oaxaca who are like, yeah, this mole is the way you make, I don't know what those other people, that they call it mole, but it's not mole. So all of, I love this sort of energy that comes around food because it's a thing that we're invested in. Oh. Um, and seeing that is so important. It's so important for us to hear that from folks. I have to tell you, Sabrina, I couldn't agree more. I had a global um, fight going on on one Middle Eastern trip that I took with President Obama on kanafa, this fabulous dessert that I love, 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 love. And mm -hmm. all my counterparts knew that I just loved it. And each of them, whether it was in the UAE or whether it was in, in, um, in um, um, Palestine or wherever we were traveling on that trip, everyone said, no, we've got the best kanafa. No, this is the original kanafa. No, kanafa is only yeah. the original. It comes from Nablus. It was hysterical. I didn't care because I kept getting kanafa and I loved all of them. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Um, and also, I, I just because that video, I thought I loved the video. I mean, mm -hmm. she had so many wonderful things to share, but she, it also made me think about issues of equity and, and access. Um, you know, moving to the digital space, it is wonderful. What we have learned is that a quality of engagement and experience, particularly with through food, whether it's a cook along or a demonstration um, can be very powerful, but it also reminds us that not everybody has access, mm. technical and te you know, the, there, there are some limitations to, you know, who can get online um, to, um, you know, the ways that things are accessible in terms of, you know, is there a sign language interpreter? Are there captions being provided? Um, are, is there visual dis, um, uh, uh, descriptions that are being offered? What about people who process differently? So we are, I hope, as a sort of community of humans, using this opportunity to think, yes, there's so much that we can do in this space, but how can we do it in a way that really is accessible to, to, to everyone? Um, and it's gonna take us a while. I know that Christina, you and I had a conversation about, you know, when we do our festival programs, we've, we've shifted obviously to digital, we're doing some cooking programs, but our accessibility coordinator, there are some platforms that drives her crazy because you know, you're on a little screen, you can't see the inside language interpreter, you're trying to show somebody cook, you're trying to have captions. And so again, we have to, we're gonna have to figure a way to work through this so that we can, when we say breaking bread together, it really is together in the fullest sense. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Sabrina. I have, I, I must say, been quite su quite surprised and pleased, um, in particularly through the work that I do with the Atlantic Council on how quickly platforms have adjusted and made um, 
um, the uh, have created the ability for uh, foreign language interpretation easier and easier. Um, we at the you know in March of last year, I had to use my phone and download an application. And now on most of them, they have that ability. But now Zoom does right within uh, the application itself. So I think we're slowly getting there. But that is an, an I mean, I think access overall just to, you know, exactly the internet is, uh, is really, really important, really important. Excellent point. Right. I remember Sabrina and I, you were, we were talking about that, like last weekend about how do we do that and does that mean that each do you make an initiative so that everybody can join or do you have to have certain versions of the initiative do you know what i mean well for us we try to layer uh, services and we again we're this is experimentation you know some things are working we have users groups where people from deaf hard of hearing communities come to us and say okay you guys really this worked but this other thing you guys need to start again and that kind of frank feedback and that's why you know these chat you know, having these, you know, dynamic chat sections are really great because it, it helps us get better. Um, I don't think that we'll ever be perfect, but, you know, we will try. And I think part of the trying is listening to folks. And I, I saw that there's a question that asked about, you know, accessibility, but things like what vegan diets and not drinking alcohol. Next year on the mall, we'll be working with the UAE and, you know, the issue of alcohol has come up. Um, and it's um, something that we take our lead from our partners. So we don't do this work alone. It's not like we're you know, parachuting and saying, this is how we're gonna do a folk life festival. It's months and sometimes years of conversation. And um, we will learn together how we can be on the mall um, honoring participants from the UAE and realize that we have Americans who are like, I want a beer. And so we're going to have, to, it's a dance that we'll have to do, um, but it's something that um, is definitely front and center in our conversations and to your, you know, Ambassador, you're, you talk so, and write, have written so beautifully about protocol. Um, it, it all starts with respect, you know, it's just about just starting with respect, asking questions clearly and, and listening to answers. Yeah, no, I, and I guess I would, one point that I would like to add, um, to, to this moment is that what I have been thrilled about uh, with the virtual space is that <clears throat> even though we, we, we do have to overcome the, the digital divide, is that I, I'm, we've been able to reach people in, at this moment in China in Germany, in uh, Colombia, you know, I mean, we're just, we're, we're, there are, there's endless possibilities as to who our audience is and how they're now participating um, in these discussions, in these events, in these uh, classes um, that never before they could. I mean, your audience, I'm sure Sabrina for the Folklife Festival will just <clears throat> continue to multiply in numbers because mm -hmm people will be able to experience it in this uh, virtual platform. It's not the same experience, but at minimum, they're, they're able to, you know, look behind the curtain and see now what is, uh, what is actually happening and how is it happening? And, and it really will depend upon, and I have to say again, the Smithsonian does an excellent job of this, of how do you curate uh, the, the experiences? You know, how are you focused on bringing that experience through the virtual platform uh, to this bigger, broader audience in a way that they will understand in particularly if it is going to be a global audience. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's just a lot of exciting possibilities now. And I, and I see us moving. I think most large events, in particular with the clients I work with now, are thinking about it's no longer only virtual or only in person, that there'll be exactly. these hybrid opportunities. So you'll have that live audience there in front of you, but you also will have major screens of technologies that will be able to bring in this bigger, broader audience. Yeah. And it's important to bring people, you're talking about bringing a, a lot of uh, larger audience. It's also important for us to bring along our colleagues. So when we are, we have, again, since 1967, been invested in on the mall face-to-face -face exchange. And so we will go to that hybrid space, but then there's still sort of, well, are you losing something when people are looking at their screen instead of this person that we brought from a million miles away? And again, communicating and setting up um, to your point about curation, curating, you know, we have a food demonstration space where 
you're bringing in, you know, maybe there's a market stall in, you know, in the UAE, and we have our food demonstration there, that these two speak to each other. It's not an either or, they, they complement with one another. And I think particularly food allows us to do that in a really amazing and beautiful way. Um, and I think that this is going to be, at least for the Folklife Festival, definitely the way we move forward in the future. Oh, you know, it's, I'm sorry, Christina. We're just, we're just oh. having a great time. <laughs> no, 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 we're just chatting away. Uh, but I have to, on that note, I just want to, I, I, I want to take the opportunity to, to um, just talk a little bit about this um, event that happened on Cinco de Mayo, because of course, you know, it's, it's a, a, a day that um, not in Mexico as much, but in the US Mexicans celebrate quite a bit. And I'm a part of this organization called the International Friends Group at, here in Washington, DC. And we had um, a person put together a Cinco de Mayo virtual event. The day before our, 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 the event, um, arriving at the door were two little bottles of tequila, a plata and reposada, and then a, um, a frozen meal of two enchiladas. And it told us to put that in the freezer until right before the event. And you know, before we clicked on, there was a whole, and this I think is so important for virtual events, is for people to have expectations. What should I be doing? What am I expected to get out of this? You have to do a lot more advanced work in educating your audience. And, and she had done that. She, had gave, she gave us a sheet that really explained uh, what was going to happen, who we were going to hear from. And the whole moment of the, the, the date of uh, Cinco de Mayo came to life for me. Um, and I sat there with my mother, because my mother lives with me, and uh, she's 100% Mexican. And <laughs> we, we listened to a chef who showed us how she put together these enchiladas and how now she's just launched this restaurant in Washington, D.C. and is selling them. And then the differences in the different styles and tastes of this tequila. I mean, you, it was fantastic because here I was with my mother and we were each nibbling and, and experiencing what she was talking about. And then we had a historian come on and talk about just the, the, the background and history of Cinco de Mayo and how it actually relates in the United States with our own civil war and, and then the effects of it. I will not go into all the details with you, but I will say it was an incredibly effective event. And it was effective, again, per, per, because she had given us this um, advanced information, uh, an agenda as to what, it, what to expect, and, and really walked us through the experience along with the fabulous enchiladas and the fant fantastic tequila, it puts you in the right mood. Um, so it was, it was these virtual events, I think are, are something that we're going to see a lot more of in the future. And I'm not sure that we could have, I would have had that really personal connection with the chef if I was in a larger venue, a larger room that may have been lost because I was so focused on her and the screen and I could see her um, every movement, uh, it was, it, there was a, a real tight connection there. Right. And you know, so this was virtual, right? It was like, you're, you're watching the screen of this. Totally of the virtual, show. completely virtual, except for the food. The food was real. <laughs> right. Food is real. That all the drinks are real. But something oh, yes. that I'm thinking about is like, so yes, you can talk with you, not talk with the chef, but like you're watching the chef and you're having this experience very much like this, right? But how do you engage with other people who are also having that experience? And Sabrina and I had talked about like, yes, you can have the dialogues, you can have the commenting features, right? But is there a better way that we can facilitate conversation? So it looks very much like you're here and here, and maybe you have conversations going on in person as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't, you know, I don't have an answer for that, but it does make me think of um, one of my friends talked about how she said, oh, I can tell we're old because we use Zoom in a particular way. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I watch, she watched her, her kids who are teenagers and she's like, the platform's on and they're like walking around doing their business. Like, you know, she goes, I'll go in there and sometimes nobody is on the screen, but it's on and they're talking to each other and they're having, they feel connected. And she said, for us, like, we have to do this. We have to, like, to your point, we have to do this sort of, you know, I need to look at you and you and otherwise I feel like we're not, we're not, we're making, we're not making the connection that we need. So I think that as we get comfortable with these platforms, some of what you're 
suggesting could happen will happen, you know, that the, we will be able to move through our spaces in a different way and we'll be okay knowing, you know, I'm going to run to the kitchen and I'm going to like make something while we're talking, I'll dip back and forth. And then, you know, we also have to think about, you know, things like AR and VR, which um, again, are other technologies that we can use. Hopefully again, all with the, the, the goal of bringing us closer together. So I feel like we're still very much in early day in the early yeah. days and we're learning how to make this technology work for us really quickly because we have to. You know, it's just and we know it's going to be with us. Yeah, I, I, I fear that um, we are not as behind the, the pandemic as as some some believe we are. Um, but and so I agree with you that we will be in this virtual space and, and even beyond and even beyond as we had discussed. Well, one thing that I wanted to to raise with you, um, Christine, is that in, in answer to your to your question, again, I, I really fall back to you know how you create a community um, in this virtual space really depends upon that host. That host has to uh, have done their research. Um, plan and prepare well in advance, not only on their technology and making sure that that's all working properly, but what's the goal of this? What do I want people once they click off to, to walk away with? And, and is there a follow-up to this? Is this a beginning of a conversation that I want to set so that um, uh, I'm asking people now to echo it out or am I asking them to come back to my platform and continue on with, uh, with future lessons? Um, and so if you're talking about uh, food being incorporated into these discussion points, Think about, okay, most Zooms are an hour. How am I going to utilize that hour effectively? Um, how am I going to open it? Who will I have on who will be um, helpful in describing that? Make sure that they're actually able to do what they say they're able to do. Um, having these chef discussions like you had with Manit, it's fantastic. They're engaging. Chefs are, are great artisans and uh, and they have most of them have fantastic personalities. And I loved her background. The fact that she had a pineapple there made me very, very happy. <laughs> happy as the uh, symbol of hospitality. Um, and then, you know, make sure that you're um, using your menu to drive that conversation. What do you want to be saying in the, to, you know, during this? It, and so have that reflective in your menu. Um, is this, are these vegetables locally grown? Are they, you know, locally sourced? Um, what in your menu is going to underscore uh, the discussion points that you want to make along the way? Um, there's so many ways in which you can think through in, in well in advance the preparation about that event that will help to create that community and then, um, and, and, and then help you achieve uh, your end goal. Yeah, and it seems like one of the, one way to do that, I mean, I'm looking at Rachel's question um, that I think is so spot on is that, you know, food doesn't exist in a, a vacuum. Right, and so there are the, all of these other art forms that connect and feed, to use a, sorry to use the term, but that feed it. So, you know, music and dance. We, this um, summer, um, we won't be on the mall again, but we're doing a weekend that we're calling Making Matters, Beyond the Mall Making Matters. And uh, it'll feature uh, workshops and demonstrations. We have a, um, a Palestinian American chef and poet coming together to talk about food and this idea of creating home and carrying home with you. Um, and we're doing these workshops and just thinking about Rachel's question is one of them we're working with this extraordinary um, master weaver from Peru. Um, and so people can come for, they're gonna have six hours to spend with her. They, she sent these kits that are just amazing with, with uh, yarn and that it's you know, organically dyed and, and the loom and you know they're going to weave something that then they can take and put on their table right so you spend it's not a cooking class and yet it will end up um, on your table something that you could talk about it'll it'll carry stories from your experience of being in this workshop but also you'll be able to carry nilda's stories because she's talking about the communities that are now being ravished by covid um, and how they're you know and you said early resilience and you know, sustain, sustainability, all of this is going to feed into you know, what ends up, I hope at someone's table 
you know, at a time when we're able really to sit together um, with that kind of intimacy. So, you know, again, food does not exist alone. We need to think about the other forms of creative expression that connect to them. Right. And like we, you're talking about like weaving these baskets together and the impact that we see on the people, right? Like these events, we want to impact many people with what we're doing and with the conversations. And yes, we need to be organized about it. But a question I woke up this morning and I was like, hmm, like how do we ask this question? How do we track success with virtual initiatives? How, if we, I know the State Department, I was reading up on a news article this morning about how the State Department had bought like maybe 600,000 worth of like advertisements on some of their events. And they found that they were tracking success of people who were liking and commenting and viewing the initiatives, right? So when we have these events, how do you see the impact trickle, you know, on the ground level with the people? Should it be the likes and comments or should it be that people are weaving the baskets and it's on their table and they're having a conversation about it forever? Do you know what I mean? And whoever wants to jump yeah. in. Um, I can just say, so there's the, the answer that I should give you as the director of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which is, you know, <laughs> we're going to do all of these evaluations and we're really, you know, concerned about success and impact. And then I can tell you the answer that I feel in my gut is, um, as a human, in some ways it doesn't matter, you know, I think and in some ways you'll never know. Again, I think that these are seeds that get planted and they get tossed out there. And if you, if you do your job well, there's, you know, you spread the seeds in a way that's really beautiful and you hope that they land in fertile soil. You don't know. Um, and that's the chance that we take when we engage in creative activities. It's like, that's the, you know, the hope, the prayer that we offer when we bring communities together, that there is deep connection that takes place. If not now, then so at some point in the future. And to me, that's what, that's what's drawn me to this work. And a lot of the questions in your and the chat have been about, you know, community, creating community, feeding community, bringing, um, you can orchestrate that only so far. Um, and the rest, you just sort of sit back and, and you, again, you hope that something um, beautiful will happen that will carry not only for this generation, but generations to come. So again, that's not an official Smithsonian answer because I'm supposed to be <laughs> saying something much more um, structured and uh, uh, professional, but um, in my gut, that's, that's what I hope for when I do this work. I, I think that is so beautifully stated, uh, Sabrina, and, um, and really authentically true. It is, um, it is exactly that, that you hope that you are sowing those seeds and that people feel um, take away from that experience, the desire to move that message forward, to share that message and experience um, forward. For me, when I was serving as, um, as chief, I, I had a great opportunity of seeing when we had the in-person experience of immediately seeing that interaction. When um, we hosted President Xi at, um, at the State Department, it was uh, Secretary Clinton and, and then Vice President Biden hosting President Xi. And we had brought in Ming Tsai, um, a very famous chef from Boston to create this, um, this meal, this sort of fusion meal between our two cultures. And when President Xi, and we had not told um, our counterparts that we were gonna have this special moment, but when we escorted um, President Xi into the room and introduced him, you saw that instant effect. I mean, his eyes just lit up. He started speaking um, in Mandarin with, uh, with um, Chef Tsai uh, back and forth and, and that was it, boom. It, that connection was stronger than any bilateral conversation as was affirmed by Secretary Clinton we could have ever had. Right there, that respect as, as Sabrina had noted and thank you for noting that, um, that welcome, that um, affirmation of, of how our cultures together are stronger, that bond, um, it, it was a, it set the right tone for the rest of the visit. And, uh, and the power of that, that comes through the connection of um, the food experience, um, frankly, I just don't think can be replicated otherwise. 
It also reminds me of, I don't know if it was in your book or in one of the videos, Capricia, it was about how um, President Obama or President Xi, they wanted President Obama to like do, make the noodles. Oh, that noodles. was President who? It was, okay. um, it was the very first engagement that President Obama had um, with the Chinese in his administration. And I didn't quite know President Obama very well at this point. And we had traveled over to China for a state visit. And uh, everything, of course, again, is very mapped out. But in the, um, the sort of 11th hour, right, as the meal is about to begin, my counterpart can, comes over to me and says, you know, Ambassador Marshall, uh, uh, President who would like President Obama to make a noodle with him. And we were like, um, I'm sorry. And he's like, yes, we want him to make a noodle. And I could tell this was really important or else they would not be asking at this time. I'm sure that this was something that President Hu thought up at the last minute. So um, I took it upon myself to approach President Obama and whisper in his ear, Mr. President, President Hu would now like you to make a noodle. And then he gave me a look that I would learn, I became very fond of later on, or maybe not so fond of, but he it was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, and, and, but he didn't say a word. Uh, I believe that he believed in that, I knew this was important in advising him to do so and, and that this was a, a critical moment in their relationship. You know, the, our relationship with the Chinese was really on tether points. And so we're trying to figure out any way that we can create these bridges. And again, the make, he stood up, stood shoulder to shoulder with President Hu. They took this lump of dough and just started bouncing it between the, to the two of them with the chef in between and created this long thin noodle. And at the end of it, what the Chinese, what was so representative of this moment was that what the Chinese were saying is that this relationship is going to be very long and we look forward to the longevity of our relationship. And President Obama knew that, instinctively knew, I need to step in here and be a part of this culture, be a part of this cultural ritual and, and create this moment uh, with my counterpart. Um, and it was incredibly effective. Well. I love that story because I've lived in China for three, four years. And, you know, I've had so many different experiences traveling across Asia where I've had to, you know, show that I am open to the cultures that I'm a part of and be respectful while I'm there. And I went to Pakistan back a few years ago and I went to a wedding and it was important that I dressed up and I had, you know, my hair done and I was like open to being in the place. And there are, again, like we've talked about this, the nuances, the respect, the going the distance, showing the people that you're there, that you, you appreciate their culture. How do we do that online? Like, how do you make that? I know, Capricia, we had talked about this as well, that like maybe you set up your background in such a way that you're respecting the person. So maybe that's how you translate this exchange. Yeah, I mean, it is difficult, as you point out, Christina, and Sabrina had noted it earlier, um, but but every element of this visual experience that we're, we're all engaged in right now, what are we wearing? Um, if, if there is something that we're eating, what, 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 what are we conveying from our background? Is there a message? Is there a virtual um, background that we would rather have so that we're all uniform in that message? Um, Anything that is seen, the moment that camera clicks on, that can um, align with the goals of that event, align with the intentionality of that host, um, is incredibly helpful. Uh, it's, it's hard uh, to do, but, um, but with that little bit of effort, with doing some research and that little bit of effort, uh, you really can make uh, a lot of differences. And you know, the other piece I must say, so, so very important from protocol perspective is exactly what you did at the top of this uh, discussion, Christina, is to welcome and then make introductions, make appropriate introductions. So the entire audience knows who are these people on the screen and why should I be listening to them? And you did that very effectively. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good point. Sarita, did you have anything to add on the topic? Um, no, I mean, I, I just, um, I, I think I have this image of, you know, these sort of long life noodles that I'm still, that are still floating around in my head. And I, again, I think to your, your point, there's also something about, um, you know, we were talking, I, I was thinking about the tactile nature of it, um, again, which, you know, we've talked a little bit about is in some ways more difficult to do in a digital space. Um, we have to do it separately. But it's also something to keep in mind. It's you know you you know ambassador you talked about getting the the um, the ingredients 
um, taking cooking classes and having the ingredients sent to you. And again, it's, it's that physicalness of it that complements the, the fact that we can't touch one another. And we, you know, we're in this you know, digital space. So it, it, it really thinking about what does hybrid mean in the fullest sense? Um, all of our senses activated, even though we can't, we're not in the same room, we're not sitting at the same kitchen. Uh, finding ways to do that is incredibly important. Mm. Right. I want to make sure that we also incorporate some of our audience's questions. You guys are all here with us. Please keep the questions coming. We love them. And I don't, I see Sabrina, you were typing on one of them. Have you answered one of them? Maybe I'll ask uh, it now. No, 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 I didn't. I, I, I responded actually... to your mom to say that I think you rock too. It's <laughs> true, yeah. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so the first question we have is, um, I don't know which one we should do. Let's do the second one, maybe. How can today's participants engage in breaking bread in their communities with their families and friends on a micro level to engage in meaningful conversations around cultural similarities and differences? That comes from the Hewitt School. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I don't know who wants to jump in. Maybe Sabrina, do you want to take I the feel question? Like in, well, I guess like in some ways, I feel like we've, we've gotten to a lot of that. Um, and you know, I, I can I think about the, the ways that we're trying to do that at the festival now. And again, it goes to this idea of these, you know, cook-alongs um, where you're with uh, either a master cook, a chef, a home cook, um, and you're having, it's in the making, you're both, you're both doing. And there, again, that's, that there's a connection there that transcends you know, this kind of wonky medium that we're all having to use right now. So I think that, you know, when you sort of thinking of those connections at the micro level, I think some of that, again, allows us to get, get to that. Um, but I also, you know, again, want to just stress that we are all learning this, you know, and that I think sometimes we may be a little too hard on ourselves. Um, we're trying to figure it out. And I think if we go in with the best intent of intentions, then we'll find things that work well and things that um, surprise us. I mean, one of the things that happened in our shift, our digital shift is um, we learned that we, we started this series called Encuentro in, a, in El Smithsonian. And when we do languages, there is a, somebody talks and they gotta stop because somebody's gotta translate it. And what we've done on, on, online now is that we were able to have artists and cooks and everybody sit down and talk in whatever language they speak, then go back, have a translate and caption. Mm -hmm. And the quality of conversation that we've gotten, um, both from the participants, from, from our art, artists, as well as from the audience, has really been extraordinary. I mean, it's just, it has, like, the first time it happened, we went, we can do this. I mean, again, this, this allows us to do something that we didn't know was possible in the digital space. So um, again, when you're talking about the sort of micro connections, um, there, there's, I, I think that we're going to learn so much from the space. It's exciting. And I would, I would, I would jump in there and, and talk about the micro connections of, of, um, with our family and, and those that we're able to, from our friends, um, gather with at our, our dinner table, um, you know, uh, since last March and certainly well before, um, a lot has gone on in our country. And um, those important discussions, important conversations um, used to happen around the dinner table. And now while we have been sort of forced into sitting at the table with mom and dad again, and in, in our household, we have uh, my mother, we have, it's multi-generational, um, you know, we can, we can engage in uh, those important discussions and bring into the discussion food and uh, seek out opportunities. I mean, I, like I said, I've had so much fun um, listening to uh, dis food discussions by like Jose Andres, who is one of my champions. I just adore him mm -hmm. and following his, some of his recipes and, and the discussion points, you know, what he has done globally uh, to 
help with those who are underserved, help with those who are downtrodden and abused um, has just been extraordinary, really nothing short of extraordinary. So we talk about that. We talk about him while we're eating his food and discuss it. So we incorporate him into the family table, the family um, discussion. And um, so yes, we, we are locked down with our family and, and sometimes just some very, very close friends that are in our pods, but it's giving us this renewed opportunity that perhaps has gone away over time of, of having these uh, very critical conversations about other cultures and, and the things that are happening with other people while we experiment with new foods, new tastes. Um, you know, raising my son, I, I was very attentive to because in my household it came naturally with a variety of people who were in my grandmother's home of uh, different foods from different places, different uh, people. And so I, I wanted him to taste tongue and um, and experience, you know, so many other dif different types of food and, um, and open his taste buds to that because again, it, it creates a, a new bridge of, uh, of understanding. But also I'm going to give a plug to etiquette because I think that while you have, while you're in your home and you have your children's attention, young adults, even, you know, millennials, I would say, make sure that you're you're talking to them about um, etiquette, how you know, your table manners. It expresses so much about you and knowing the proper way to use chopsticks says so much as well. You know, you don't ever stab your food with them. You use them appropriately. So, so take this time to teach them how to use them appropriately because it is, it also conveys certain messaging that you are respecting that person that you're dining with, that, uh, that you have taken the, uh, taken the time to get to know uh, precisely, how, not just only what you're eating, but how you're eating it. Oh, agreed. There's so much there. I'm like chopsticks. Yes. Do never stab your chopsticks. Okay. Like it, it signals death. It's not a good thing. Okay. I know, I know from being over there, but another thing I'm thinking is like, we often overlook, and even I did this, right? Like we have communities right in front of us. There are people right downstairs who I don't know who, like, I don't know much about their background. DC has a huge Ethiopian culture. I don't know much about Ethiopia, right? But we're so quick to be like, okay, diplomatic initiatives, everything. We have to go to China. We have Chinese communities that we do not understand in the States. So when we think of this micro level, I think COVID has really given us the opportunity to say, hey, we don't know all of our American communities. Let's look inward first. And I saw a great quote today that said, great diplomacy starts from the ground up. Start within the US, then you push your way out in meeting and getting to know other countries as well. I think that's so true. And that's when I think about, you know, the Folklife Festival, we, you know, or what some of our themes are countries or cities. And I, I always say, we may be, you know, it may be Peru that we are bringing to the mall, but this allows us to think about your neighbors, right? It's not just like folks are going to go back and you're, you know, it, you think about the Peruvian American who may be teaching your child, you know, math um, and allows you, know, you to maybe ask questions there. So this idea of sort of moving between spaces and again, Food allows us to do that in such a um, in a way that's often not threatening um, is really truly important. I mean, to your point, it's it, it's it's not either it's not here or there. Um, you know, we in some ways we really are together. And again, the space, the digital space, only reinforces that. Um, and we need to transfer again that learning and that knowledge from this digital experience into the quote unquote real life experience. Um, and so again, those connections are follow us as we as we move through our streets and our neighborhoods. Yes, that I, I'm looking at the time and it's like one o'clock and I'm looking at the questions there. <laughs> Everyone, this is a continued conversation. We are Definitely. going post COVID, we are still going to be using the virtual sphere. We are still going to have these diplomatic initiatives and people coming together. So this is an ongoing conversation. Please, for everybody who has um, emailed in questions, I will take them down and we can keep this going off offline and keep the answers coming. But I wanna thank Sabrina and Capricia for coming. Do you guys have any last minute thoughts that you wanna share? Ambassador, thank you. We'll give it to you. <laughs> Exactly. And thank you. you.
Thank you all so much for joining us. This will be up in the next 24 hours on YouTube. So share, like, and subscribe. No, but we will see. <laughs> you have to, you have to if you're saying YouTube channel. But thank you all so much again for joining. Thank you, Sabrina and Capricia for joining us as well. Ongoing conversations, so much great stuff to unpack here. Have a great evening and a great weekend as well. Thank you.